In conjunction with New Year's, this video will serve as the inauguration of a brand new series for this channel, which I'm willing to bet you'll all thoroughly enjoy, and I'm dubbing it Artifact of the Week. Through it, we'll be delving through the weird and wonderful artifacts and artifact types which testify to ancient Egypt's magnificence. Fittingly enough, this week's episode is going to be about an obscure and peculiar, yet beautiful artifact type referred to as New Year's Flasks. So what are these New Year's Flasks? Well, they're these small, mold-made containers in the shape of slightly squashed balls with short necks made out of a glass-like material called faience, or more accurately, glazed composition. Oddly enough, most of the sources I used for this video describe them as lenticular or lentoid, i.e. in the shape of a lentil. So if you ever need to describe anything that looks like a lentil but isn't a lentil, you can thank me for teaching you some new words for them. They came in all sorts of colors too, including yellow, turquoise, and green, although after being around for millennia, they've faded a bit. Anyways, these New Year's flasks all share some basic features that vary from piece to piece. Their necks are all shaped like papyrus umbels and end in smooth, concave mouths. But they're decorated with depictions of elaborate bundles of another plant found along the Nile, the lotus. The base of the necks of these things also offer another interesting bit of art. Handles in the shapes of animals, usually an ape crouching and covering its mouth with its hands. I know some of these look more like amorphous blobs at first glance, but if you look closely at them, you'll see what I'm talking about. In addition, some examples also have handles in the shapes of ibexes, folded papyrus bundles, and flowers. Both sides of the top of the flask's body are usually incised with multiple concentric registers filled with a variety of geometric designs, including rectangles, triangles, circles, teardrops, and floral motifs. These could represent two things, an extravagant Wessex collar, a type of collar worn by actual people, as depicted here, or a kind of vegetal collar, hence the floral motifs, that was also worn by participants in ceremonies and festivals, but was additionally placed onto the neck of jars. Otherwise, the bodies of these flasks seem to mostly be undecorated, but some do bear depictions of various deities. Even the edge bands that separate the two sides of the flask's body are oftentimes decorated with things like chevron patterns, herringbone patterns imitating papyrus basket work, or even inscriptions and hieroglyphs. Speaking of inscriptions, as I'm sure you've noticed by now, these flasks often bear inscriptions arranged in vertical columns, which can be found both on their edge bands and the center of their bodies, which still wish their owners a happy new year millennia after the years for which they were made. The standard formula they all employ in doing this translates to inaugurates a perfect year for its lord, i.e its owner. But who's doing this inaugurating? Well, this formula is preceded by the name of a deity or deities, which are usually the ones revered in the various regions of Egypt that these flasks come from. For example, the two inscribed New Year's flasks found in the city of Necratus in the Nile Delta each mention a different locally significant deity, Amun-Re, the main god worshipped there, and the cat-headed fertility goddess Bastet, who was a significant deity in the Delta as a whole. New Year's flasks have been found at sites all across Egypt, and I know for sure that they've been found at the Temple of Karnak and Thebes, at Memphis, in sites in Dakla oasis like Ain Manawir and Tel Markula, and at the aforementioned city of Necratus, where light yellow flasks were probably manufactured alongside scarabs using lead antimonate. Weirdly enough, New Year's flasks have also been found all over the Mediterranean, including the Eastern Aegean, especially in Rhodes, where some flasks might have actually been produced. Cyprus, Italy, Carthage, and even Spain. I mean, that's crazy to me. Spain, wow. Although a lot of other artifact types from Pharaonic Egypt endured for millennia, the New Year's flasks were only produced near the end of a single dynasty, the 26th, and the beginning of the first Persian occupation of Egypt, which immediately followed the 26th dynasty's downfall. This is reinforced by the fact that the cartouches of only three royals have ever been found on them. That of Apries, the third last pharaoh of the 26th dynasty, Amasis, the second last pharaoh of the dynasty, and the princess-slash-priestess Ancnes Neferibre, who was their contemporary. 
Amasis is probably the most fascinating of the three, given how he usurped the throne, and I've even made a video about him, which you can find linked in the description. Interestingly enough, the flasks do seem to sort of vary through their short period of use, in that a defining characteristic of flasks from the 7th century is that they often bear depictions of the fertility goddess Hathor in the guise of a cow in the marshes. However, this type of vessel, dubbed the Pilgrim's Flask, started coming to Egypt from the Levant all the way back in the New Kingdom, but they soon started being produced by the Egyptians themselves. Originally, it was probably a kind of container for some precious substance distributed in small quantities like oil or perfume, given how small these flasks usually are and given how they were interred in burials, suggesting that they may have contained something personal to the burial's occupants. One scholar has suggested that they held some sort of spice meant to be added to wine, given how they're often found with wine amphorae in the Levant. This is supported by the fact that in 2013, some flasks in the Levant were found to have traces of cinnamon, which only came from southern India and Sri Lanka at the time, believe it or not. This is important to understanding the purpose of these objects, which I'll go through... Now! You see, these flasks were likely gifts associated with the beginning of a new year. The standard formula I mentioned being written on them even contains a phrase that's been judged to be the equivalent of our Happy New Year, Wepet Renpet Nefert, which translates to Good New Year's Day, which, as we mentioned before, was supposed to be granted by the gods mentioned on them. The ancient Egyptian New Year's took place around July the 19th, right at the beginning of Akhet, the season in which the Nile would flood its banks, rejuvenating the land by depositing extremely fertile black silt onto the fields it flooded, which was the key to Egypt's agricultural success. So it's basically the opposite of our year, but there's a good reason for it. Fittingly, these New Year's flasks are jam-packed with things symbolizing renewal. The likely reason baboons are so commonly found adorning the necks of these flasks is that they were seen as symbols of rebirth. That's because they were seen as welcoming the rising sun each morning through their behavior. You see, the sun was believed to die each night and be reborn each morning. The flask's slightly squashed disc shape may also echo the sun disc. Another possible reason behind the baboon's presence is that baboons are a form of the god Thoth, who enjoyed an intimate association with the New Year's in Egypt, given that he was associated with the calculation of time and the renewal of royal power during the New Year's festival. Since they were associated with the yearly renewal of the flood, the flasks were included in burials, both within and outside Egypt, as they themselves symbolized the rebirth of the deceased they were buried with. So what was actually put into these little suckers? Well, we don't actually know uh, exactly what was put in them, but it was probably some sort of perfume, oil, or even water from the Nile. The theory that these flasks were filled with cosmetic liquids is supported by the existence of an unguent made specifically for New Year's, but given the ancient Egyptian New Year's connection with the annual Nile flood, the flasks may have instead carried water from the flood, which was given its own term, and was considered to have regenerating and purifying properties. However, contrary to all this, the only chemical analysis of the contents of one of these flasks I know of found traces of honey of all things, although this may have been a result of the flask being reused at some point. So that's definitely something to keep wondering about. So that about wraps up our discussion of New Year's flasks. I hope you all have a happy New Year's, and stay tuned for more fascinating content about the ancient world's most fascinating civilization. See ya!